Hello and welcome to everyone who's joined us from Pro Manchester and Professional Liverpool. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jen Hazelhurst, I'm the Chair of Pro Manchester and the Liverpool Office Managing Partner for EY. I feel very privileged to be hosting this webinar today, bringing together hopefully the Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, and the Mayor of the Liverpool City Region, Steve Rotherham. We're going to talk today about the Northwest Economic Region, maybe even the North, and how the power of collaboration can increase our influence in the UK and help us as we respond and exit the current environment. Never before has collaboration between business, communities, and even politicians been so critical if we're all going to successfully navigate through the effects of this COVID-19 pandemic. Collaboration is vital. It provides the opportunity to build strong links with other regions and work towards a common goal. My role at EY and at Pro Manchester sees me working across Liverpool and Manchester and championing both cities. I said in my opening speech as chair of Pro Manchester, that I was encouraged to see that both cities were increasingly taking a joined up approach and becoming a voice for the North. I think we can see that more than ever now. Between them, Steve and Andy have jointly lobbied several government, central government on many different themes, such as devolution, homelessness, transport, and now on COVID-19 and how we plan for the recovery. So at this point, I was hoping to hand over to both our Metro Mayors, Andy Burnham and Steve Rotherham, to uh, welcome you to the um, uh, webcast and thank you for your time today. At the moment, we've currently got Andy with us. Unfortunately, we have a slight technical hitch with Steve Rotherham that we're currently just sorting out. However, Andy, if it's possible from yourself, just to get a five minute introduction and to set the scene as to what you and Steve are currently focused on at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Jen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to resist making any jokes about uh, digital Liverpool lagging uh, behind, unable to get its mayor online, but I'm, hopefully he will uh, he will join us uh, soon. Maybe it's down to, to his lack of digital skills, I, I would I would imagine. But um, uh, it's a good time to update you all today. Uh, so thanks, Pro Liverpool, Pro Manchester, for bringing this uh, event together because Steve and I have just been on a call with the Prime Minister uh, this morning, and um, you know we've got a lot of. Uh, uh, words ringing in our ears really from that and uh, a real sense of, of actually how the recovery is going to take shape. If I was to answer your question, Jen, it feels to me that this was the week where response kind of began to move towards the sort of uh, move back a bit and recovery has kind of moved to the fore and that has occupied uh, a lot of our week this week, just beginning to understand what lies ahead. Um, and I can share with you some of our, our thinking uh, about uh, about where that's up to. Obviously, it's such a complex challenge. I'm sure you are all uh, aware of that in your own organisations, uh, just how we move from where we are today back to a, a sense of normality. Um, but I think it needs to be a new normality, and I'm going to come on to that uh, a bit later on. But I, of course, you know, we're all going through those those um, those thoughts. If you think of it from Steve and my point of view, um, you know, we've got to think about how do we get our cities and city regions moving again, but in a in a responsible, sustainable, manageable way. Um, so at the forefront of that thinking is, of course, public transport. Um, and we've just been debating with the Prime Minister, you know, how we both fund public transport through this period, given that um, the fare box has fallen quite low uh, and it's a, a real challenge for us. Um, but also, how is public transport going to operate? Are we going to have social distancing on public transport? Or are we going to have uh, the wearing of face coverings, even face masks, to allow greater density on public transport? And these are, as of yet, unresolved questions, but they are debates that we are having right now, just to bring you right up, up to speed. And its impact on you, of course, is that that dictates how many people we can get into the city centre, into your offices. Um, and how we then do that in a manageable way. We have touched on the issue of uh, changing the working day, uh, so staggering uh, people's start times. I'm sure we're going to be coming to all of you to say, you know, it won't be everybody back in the office at once. It's going to be a managed uh, process. But that that is very much where we are uh, as of as of today. And 
I made a call last week, which I, I, I hope is gathering a bit of um, a bit of support now. Um, and it's right on cue. Uh, uh, the um, Liverpool finally uh, enters the digital age. Um, I I made a call <laughs> last week. He's getting he's getting all his lines ready to fire back at me in a minute. So you'll wait wait for that. Um, that we shouldn't have a region by region release from lockdown. I thought that posed real risks for us uh, here in the Northwest. But nor should we have a strict sector by sector release, because I think that would create unforeseen consequences for businesses in certain parts of the economy and could unfairly hold some back. But also other businesses wouldn't have their supply chain coming back if they were in different sectors. So I put the argument forward for a standards led approach or indeed a safety led approach where you know, we, we, we kind of say to businesses, the issue is, can you uh, put in place safe working arrangements uh, and protect your staff? And that if you can, then that allows people progressively to come back. And it's interesting that the government is increasingly talking uh, about that uh, with a role for the HSE to, to over, oversee it. And I think that's the right uh, approach. I did make the point on the call with the Prime Minister that that means perhaps some sectors wouldn't be able to come back as quickly as others in terms of full strength because of the complexity of observing distancing in the workplace. And for those businesses, I think we need to be talking now about a flexible furlough scheme um, so that we don't have a cliff edge with furlough and we don't have uh, people on furlough then being made redundant uh, in, in large numbers. What we need is a, a furlough scheme that can be flexible responding to the different parts of the economy which will just need that bit of extra bit bit of extra help uh, going forward so hopefully that that point landed uh, jen i'll say one more point before handing back to you and uh, uh, allowing steve to come in but it is in many ways to kind of uh, go to that point about steve and i working together because you know we want this to be um, a conversation that we have as one northwest because the challenge is huge we are going to need uh, to support each other and in everything we do, Steve and I are conscious that we'll make your life easier if there is some consistency between what we're both uh, doing, um, because obviously many of the businesses on this call work across the two uh, cities and city regions. So we, we see that and we try and respond to that for you. And we do do a lot of events jointly, as you will have seen. But also we're trying to develop our thinking together. And we are putting forward this notion of a build back better campaign. Um, you know, how can we kind of use this as a bit of a reset moment uh, to improve um, people's working lives, to capture the clean air benefit that we've seen, manage the congestion uh, better. And if we're having a phased return to work, then there's obviously an opportunity there for us to um, us to do that. How do we uh, advance sectors of the economy that we've been talking about for some time? So, for instance, the, the green economy, is this a, an opportunity to really pull that uh, forward? Can we make progress on clean air? So get support to small businesses, self-employed taxi drivers to change their vehicles as a stimulus to the economy, and but also meeting that objective that we've all talked about, which is cleaning up the, um, the, the city region. Can we take the uh, efforts that are underway in both places around digital infrastructure and really advance those, those schemes now? Uh, and again, this is a theme that came up with the Prime Minister, so that we can capture the benefits of home working uh, for, for more uh, more people. So that's what Build Back Better is about. But I have to say too, it's also about employment uh, standards. You know, I'm, it's never lost on me that there are certain people who've been able to, to live their life via video screens at home over the last few months, but there's others who've been out at work keeping the country running and they sadly are often in the lowest paid, most insecure employment. And Steve and I both feel strongly that the good employment agenda now needs to come to the fore. We in Greater Manchester have developed a good employment charter which is about decent working standards for everybody. Uh, Steve uh, has developed a similar uh, entity called the Fair Employment Charter. You know, we've very much worked together on those things to make sure they are uh, they are in in um, in tune with each other. We think that is something that now needs to be um, to be advanced. You know, the idea that we have a very divided economy, I don't think works for anybody. You know, it doesn't work for business productivity uh, to have. Uh, many people in very low paid, insecure work. So we think the Northwest is well placed here to talk about a Build Back Better campaign, which is about capturing the benefits of the time that we've been in, in terms of cleaner air, more active travel and cycling. We've just been talking about 
more digital infrastructure, more homeworking, uh, capturing the, the success on homelessness, having brought a lot of people in inside. But yeah, also improving everyone's working life and, and then building a greater sense of national unity coming out of that, because it's been a divided uh, decade, hasn't it, over the last few years? But let's see if we can turn this to a kind of a sense of more common purpose now uh, and that we're all working together towards the uh, the common good. And that's what Build Back Better is all about. We're looking, we're looking to formally launch the campaign next week and we want to recruit businesses who want to support us in that in that endeavour. So it's a really great time to talk to everybody. Thanks for listening uh, and I'll hand you all back to Jen. Thanks, Andy. And, and that's a great introduction. Thank you. And Steve, great to have you with us. Um, welcome. So maybe, Steve, I'll hand to yourself just to give a brief introduction, but also to just build there on what Andy has been talking about in terms of Build Back Better. And what do businesses need to do differently in order to build back better? And what support do us as businesses need from central and local governments to help us? Thanks, Jen. Um, brilliant photo behind you, by the way. Probably the best out of uh, all the backdrops we'll see today. Um, the great thing about sort of missing the first bit of Andy is I didn't have to listen to it for too long. Um, but the worst bit is, of course, he robs all the best lines. He's a past master at this. Um, <laughs> but the great thing about um, our personal friendship and also our political alignment is that what we're trying to do is to break down some of that silo mentality that has held the Northwest back for far too long. And certainly some of that tribalism, uh, it, it's it's okay in certain arenas, but you know, it, on a business um, uh, and sector scale, it, it shouldn't really be an influence at all because as Andy just said, there will be businesses who work in both of our great city regions and beyond as well. So the idea behind Build Back Better, uh, as Andy's explained, is about not going back to some of the things that were happening before, uh, you know, going back to a country allowing the undervalued staff in our NHS, so the cleaners and the care workers, to be also underpaid and I think we've all seen now that it is a different world over the last, you know, five, six weeks, is it now, that we've been out, we've clapped for our care workers. They need a little bit more than that now. They need to be financially supported. And I think that's what we're talking about, building it back better, rather than what originally the government were talking about, which is bouncing back. And that for me means going back to what we had previously. I think we have to change the, the dynamic in the way the public and private sector have operated. So in our area, for instance, we are looking to mop up underspends currently on projects to put them forward in a pot because we believe that the best way we can secure the recovery is to limit the damage today. And we're trying to ensure that any funding um, that we allocate uh, means that those organisations would be part of the better working in the future, the building back better. So I, I think it's going to be a, a new social contract, if you like, a, a way in which um, the powers that we have and the funding that follows them, them powers will be used in a slightly different way. And yeah, for me, um, it is about that fair employment charter, that good employment charter. It is about people recognising people's worth and not just the um, the way in which they've been paid previously. So I, I, I think the greatest example is the highest paid consultant in a hospital is now reliant on somebody on £8.72 an hour on a minimum wage. And those cleaners are as equally important in that chain of patient survival as anybody else. And we can pick that out in sector after sector after sector. Uh, and we, as I've Andy's mentioned, we had a phone call with uh, Boris Johnson earlier today. And we're very, very keen to look at working with government. But because we have the scale and synergy of combined authority areas, we can do things much more quickly 
national government with its command and control and its one size fits all doesn't really help in these circumstances. We've seen that with the call for PPE when national government was struggling and we could procure much more locally. There's lots of other things that we'll need to do. I'd say um, one of the big issues that probably Andy hasn't touched on because he knows I will is around the skills agenda. And that's where this new way of working together, this building back better, can really pay dividends for the future for us all. Thank you, Steve. And um, certainly something for us to think about there in terms of pay structures within businesses as well. Andy, you talked about a number of the challenges that the cities might see as we come out of, of COVID. And certainly a question that a number of our members have asked is, how do you see working practices changing in cities post COVID? Sorry. Uh, I was enjoying that. Can you carry on? <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for the question, everyone who's asked it. I guess it's something for us to agree together because I don't think Steve and I want to be in the kind of um, space of saying we're going to mandate this, we're going to mandate that. I just don't think it will work like that. I think we need to do this together. Um, how might it change if we're thinking of, of office life? Well, of, the obvious thing, of course, is fewer people in the office. I, I you know, Steve and I worked in London, obviously, as MPs for a number of years. So, you know, we we kind of see both worlds. Our world is quite traditional when it comes to the working day. It is still a very nine to five working day. And it's always been that way. And that then does create tremendous pressure on the public transport system at particular times of the day. And I would say there's, there's so many things I could point to about how work will change. But I, I, I do hope the main one is more home working so people trusted to work at home who want to work at home and who would find that that's better in terms of balancing their home commitments kids etc or caring responsibilities um i i do think it's about uh, a staggered uh, start and end time to the working day uh, because obviously you know we all any uh, colleagues on the call from manchester will know i mean you know the, the congestion is just uh, out of control at times and you know that's a product of lots of things isn't it poor infrastructure and all the things we know but it is also made by ourselves by kind of all jumping in the car and all coming in at the same at the same time so you know, we are going to want to have a conversation with you about what what might a, a different office week look like in terms of not everybody in the office every day uh, more efforts to set up people to who want to work at home to work at home Recognising though, don't force people to work at home because some people's home environment might not support that kind of um, approach. So I, I think that's the way to start thinking about it. You know, Steve and I are really clear that the public transport system, you, you, you will probably have to have it in your own minds that it's at best it's going to be running at 40 to 50 percent this year. I don't know if Steve would agree if he's, he's nodding there. I mean, that's basically what, what we're having to think about. You know, if you're going to go with social distancing on public transport, you're looking at 20 percent if you're going to go with face masks you might be able to get it up to 40 or 50 but even so you know that's going to require us to change we don't want to mandate to you how we do it but i think we need to kind of work through with you what the kind of structure for that looks like and it's going to be difficult if every company is doing its own thing i think i think we're going to have to all of us agree a sort of new way a new way of working um you know a, a staggered structure to the working day if i could put it like that but also, you know, really facilitating home working. You know, we're both going to be making a case to the government about massively expanding um, full fibre across across both city regions, um, because that that is one uh, economic benefit that I think we can um, we can take from this this moment. Because there's going to be a need as well to 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 give that stimulus to the economy uh, as soon as we get out of this. So I hope that answers the question, Jen. There's more to say, but I but I do think it will mean quite profound changes to the um, traditional office work. Thanks, Andy. And certainly a good steer there for businesses to be thinking about as they plan coming out of the pandemic. 
and, and certainly some of the questions that we're raising internally within EY, but also that our staff are asking as well. And I'm so, sure a lot of businesses are hearing those same questions being asked from staff. Um, moving now maybe just to um, back to the sort of present in, in terms of the, the current COVID situation. And again, a, a very repetitive question from our members here. Um, you know, both Manchester and Liverpool have a lot of startup businesses and um, great for innovation. And a, and a real concern from our members that they're slipping through some of the central government support. So, Steve, maybe if, if you can um, answer around what start, what help is there for, for startups and other businesses that might fall through the cracks? And is there any more help coming down the line as well? And this is where not just Manchester and Liverpool as city regions, but also nationally, us working with the government we can start to address some of the concerns that no doubt members in both city regions will have. The, every time the government seems to announce something and they are literally eye-watering sums of money in those announcements, it seems that within a few hours and sometimes within a few minutes, people have started to identify the gaps and the fact that there are companies, individuals, who have fallen through the cracks in the announcements. And what we've tried to do through this group of M9, the Metro Mayor group, we try to feed that through to government and say, for instance, on the uh, self-employed, we were right off, we were the first off the mark, and, and we said, you need to do something about this and freelancers and all that sort of stuff. On the SMEs, we've been saying to the government that they needed to extend um, the scheme, but also to look at the dates and the parameters around it. But beyond all that, and it is about national government responding in an appropriate way, what is it that we can do? And so, for instance, a lot of the, the stuff that I've talked about before, mopping up some of that underspend in the city region, we've targeted that towards uh, SMEs and really towards micros, to tell you the truth, uh, about 98% of our businesses are in that cohort and we need to ensure that they're still around or as many as possible are still around for when lockdown ends and we get back to this, this new norm, um, certainly in the ways of working. And, and that's why we are, for instance, your conduit. You might well have other ways in which you can contact the government um, they're probably not the same route that we can take. So we have direct ins to number 10. We uh, have got a conversation shortly with the Treasury. So we need to know from your members the sorts of things and the sorts of questions that we need to be asking of government. And that's the, I think, the beauty of, of having devolution in two areas. Uh, although I believe that many more areas in the Northwest also should have some sort of devolvement. Thank you, Steve. And um, maybe Pro Manchester and Professional Liverpool, we can take that away and, and really identify from our members the, the businesses that are really falling through the cracks and, and struggling there. Um, you, um, I think, and Andy, do you just want to, to follow up on, on something there? Just, uh, thanks, Jen. Just briefly, um, Steve, uh, said most of it really and but it is right about that point about the gaps sometimes becoming apparent so I'm hearing a lot of frustration uh, from businesses in Greater Manchester who don't have that business rates um, uh, number you know so there's many people in shared working space um, or who rent you know and, and I just think that is a real unfairness still um, and I do think we need to advocate uh, on that for people there's the new starter issue that's still a, a problem um, not all self-employed people. So we're aware of some of the gaps, but as Steve said, you know, let, let us know about more of them. But one of the things we have made the pitch for uh, to the Prime Minister today is flexible devolved funding. I think as Steve was saying, you know, give us funding now to support our economies quickly because, you know, it's going to be a really tough process what lies ahead. And let us devise schemes that will support people in the way that we know need to be done. So, um, you know, we are able to make that um, case to government for you, but, you know, we can also start to think about how we might design even more support ourselves. And, um, you know, it's on both of those fronts that we'll be, we'll be working. 
Thanks, Andy. And certainly one of the questions that we had around those businesses falling through the cracks was a business with suddenly zero revenue and still paying business rates. So absolutely, that's a, a definite problem. I want to turn now to um, the power of the North and that collective voice and the impact on government. And, and Steve, you touched on this there in terms of the fact that in, in Manchester and Liverpool, we do have these devolved responsibilities in certain areas. So what is it about collaboration of, of Manchester and Liverpool that can really benefit the, the North West and, and maybe even the North as a whole? The first thing for me is for the recognition at a national level of the power of those two great city regions in the North. We, we Myself and Andy are also representatives of the Northern Powerhouse, of Transport for the North, of the Convention of the North. So we are trying to get the North, a, a, you know, in its wider sense, um, some sort of recognition. It's about 16 million people in the North. And when you think London is, you know, eight and a half million or whatever, it's about double that. But if you even then segment further, Greater Manchester and Liverpool City region, as a bigger population GDP and GVA than Scotland and yet Scotland through their first minister Nicola Sturgeon have a seat at COBRA they have regular dialogue and meetings with the prime minister and I know it's a nation I, I, you know I'm not trying to say that it, it should be Liverchester or whatever it, 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 it needs to have some sort of national recognition of its strategic and its economic importance and in a, a post-Brexit world, remember when everything was just about Brexit, I'd be glad to get back to talking about one day the issues like Brexit at some stage, but um, in a post-Brexit world, the port of Liverpool and Manchester International will become strategically important for the country. I think someone's left that. Um, and that's what we're trying to do, get government to start a win because we hit really, really hard. Employment rates have been the highest probably since the 80s, and our business failure rate is going to probably be the highest again for decades. So we're trying to look at recovery now and build in recovery, and that's why working together, we will start to get that, that scale and synergy. Um, which hopefully the government will find difficult to respond to. Thank you, Steve. And Andy, you highlighted in your joint mail address last week that the English regions don't really have a voice in the COBA meetings at the moment. And, and Steve, you touched on that just then. So, Andy, how do you see potential involvement in those national COBA meetings as representatives of the region being beneficial? And, and are we any closer to, to having that? Um, I think so, um, Jen. The frustration for Steve and I is, I think we played a part in getting the voice of the North higher up the political agenda than it had ever been before uh, earlier this year. <laughs> And just when we kind of got it there, we find ourselves in this situation. So it is a little frustrating. I've got a lot of feedback as well on the line. I don't know if that if everyone else has got that. Um, it's frustrating, but um, I, I, one of the points I made on the call to the Prime Minister was, you know, this can't mean that levelling up goes off the agenda. It, it, in many ways, the levelling up um, uh, has to come back with a vengeance now, you know, because it's parts of the economy where the infrastructure is poorest that we might be hit hardest by the, um, the, the, the position that we're in. And therefore, the government needs to see this as a moment to accelerate um, that whole levelling up uh, agenda. And, and Steve will agree. I mean, to be fair, you know, he, he, he was completely com in a Boris type way. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Absolute, you know, when, when, when that was said. So, I don't think it's fake. I, 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 I think he thinks his own government's political mission is bound up with with this. And obviously, time will tell. Um, 
as to whether or not it what it turns into. It, it was disappointing to me, you know, because obviously I've been in government. I mean, I, I know how these things work. You know, when I chaired the COBRA on swine flu, which is what I did a decade ago, we had voices from around the country on that call. And it was disappointing. I think they went to a very narrow default mindset in Whitehall that, oh, just London, just the mayor of London comes on the COBRA call. And and that that worried me, to be honest. I, I thought it signaled something different. Now, the Prime Minister's back from um, being off and he's saying, no, it's all back on the agenda and let's let's hope so. But, you know, I think what they've got now in, in Steve and myself is, you know, that we try and do it in the right way. We don't play pointless politics and, and the point scoring. We kind of left that in Westminster, both of us. But we will be tough when it comes to um, holding them to account for all of you and we'll do it in the right way. But I think they know that now. They, they know that, that, you know, because we don't cry wolf, if you like, and, you know, we don't everything that they do say it's wrong. If we do come out jointly and say, no, this is wrong. You know, this is not fair to us because of X, Y and Z. They know they'll have a political problem if we if we do that. And I, I hope you all agree that that's well, that's how we've tried to build it together anyway. You know, a very pragmatic approach. Say where they get it right, say so and be grateful. But actually know that if they don't, then they're going to know about it. And, you know, we're going to um, to, to give them a, you know, a real challenge. So I, I kind of feel that's where we are with the government at the moment. Um, but I do think the coming period in terms of how they gear us up to deal with this massive recovery job that's in front of us will kind of tell us whether the it's talk or whether it's real. And, you know, we've seen nine out of the 10 Greater Manchester Councils receive a pretty big cut this week in terms of central government support uh, to deal with the costs of COVID. And I know Liverpool, the city, has had a massive uh, reduction as well. We're still waiting for a deal on Metrolink. Still do not know whether they will cover the costs of the loss of the fare box on Metrolink. Same with Mersey Rail. So, the, you know, I, I kind of put that down to the civil service having been in charge for a few weeks and no prime minister being around and they just doing what they normally do. But, but the test is arriving now, you know, and we're going to have to really see whether or not they, they help us because Steve's right. The issue has got to be not the Treasury doing what it normally does and kind of argue over every penny. They've just got to help us now. If they help us recover now, we'll preserve more of the economy, we'll minimise the social damage. If they don't help us now, this road ahead looks pretty grim as far as I can see. Thanks, Andy. Um, I think now we'll move on to, to devolution and, and a topic that both of you have been very engaged on. And as, as you've already highlighted, so important if we're going to make decisions in the North to try to get a power grid system in our community. So maybe, uh, Steve, if you can just explain what areas of responsibility you have and, and I'll then pass to Andy. And, and then also, if you look at each other's devolved areas of responsibility, what would you like that the other ones got? I didn't hear all the questions yet, but I know it was about devolution uh, and certainly the, the last bit will be interesting, won't it? Um, certainly for Andy, it'll probably be uh, the Premier League back in Manchester, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, what? what? <laughs> it's still in Manchester. You haven't won it, mate. <laughs> it's not going <laughs> to It's coming. It's coming. Um, so, yeah, the, um, the big issue about devolution for me is that when... Uh, myself and Andy were um, in in Parliament. We'd sit there and literally you can sit for four or five hours and not leave the chamber, literally sit there and stuff would be happening. And I would get, and I know he would, but I, I'd get so frustrated, I'd get wound up. Andy was a bit more used to it than I was. I'd come from a sort of council background where, you know, it was very much, you know, uh, hammer and tongue we went at, and, at it and stuff. All of a sudden, you have to learn this new parliamentary procedure. And I wanted to scream at times because there didn't seem to be any understanding of the policy announcements on areas like mine and on people from ordinary working class backgrounds. And, I, I you know, I, I thought there's probably a better way of doing this. And then, of course, there was all this talk with George Osborne about devolution and I got really interested in that. And that's why, you know, um, on one of the rare occasions, because I, I didn't used to bother socialising in the in the um, in the bars and 
restaurants in the Commons. Um, me and uh, Andy went outside, and we had a, we had a drink and we had a talk about, you know, what do, what would this mean? And just imagine if you could get to people who understood the national picture, but also locally what it would mean to Greater Manchester. And, and that's how this all started because nobody understands our areas better than ourselves. And I'm talking about the geographical spread. There may be people who understand bits of the economy or bits of the geography better than we do. But it, it, as, as a big picture, there's nobody because we've got access to all of the data and all of the, the people who can pull together the evidence around our areas. So when government now is about to make announcements, we're saying, for goodness sake, will you speak to us? Because we can tell you what the impact of your announcement will be in our areas. And if we work together, we can get a bigger bang for the book for um, UK PLC. And in many instances, that does happen. I mean, this is a you know, an unprecedented period, we all know that, but in many other instances, they are starting to work with us. And that, it's not likely to say anything um, nice about the Prime Minister, but on this occasion, he, I think, does get devolution because he's been the Mayor of London and he's seen the benefits of having those powers uh, put into the hands of the people who understand their areas best. Thanks, Steve. And, and Andy, just coming to, to you, obviously the, the devolved powers that, that you and Steve have are slightly different between the two cities. So maybe if you can just um, explain what differs and also, therefore, you know, what, what you'd quite, quite like to have instead in an ideal world. So, that, so they are quite different. And Steve, I'm sure won't disagree with me in saying that ours is a much more uh, substantial devolution uh, deal. So I'm the Police and Crime Commissioner. Um, we have a degree of health devolution. Um, we have uh, housing um, uh, funding that, that Steve doesn't. Um, but I want all of that for him as well. Uh, and the thing I would say about devolution is it makes more sense the more you fill in the pieces of the jigsaw. So we both are arguing very strongly for post-16 uh, skills, um devolution because we, to take steve's point why has this country never done a good job with skills number one there's a snobbery about technical education and it's always been there but number two you can't devise skills policies at the national level that are sensitive to all the different city regional economies you know the one size fits all really doesn't work so skills policy is a classic example the closer you bring it to the labor market the better it will get and um, you know that is an argument for for devolution um, and so we both would really I think make a huge play for skills devolution alongside more control over uh, housing the housing market um, department for work and pensions because we think the national programs I would say waste a lot of money and don't do a good enough job in getting people back to work or the training that they really want so that's where I think we're, we're up to. I, if any way, you know, many ways, you've always got to see opportunity in moments like this. It could be a big, op good moment for devolution. And I think we both came off the call with the Prime Minister, hearing him in pretty good spirits, given everything. And obviously, he's had his good news this week, but he was, wasn't he, Steve? He was in a very, very sort of a, a bullion sort of form, but also very, very passionate about, you know, the. He was, oh, the cities are going to lead this and you're going to help us lead it. And, you know, so he doesn't need any persuading, to be fair. Um, and I think he, as mayor of London, felt the same frustrations that we do with the Whitehall, uh, the Whitehall machine. So it is a big moment for devolution. So what do I want? I want more control over skills, over DWP. Uh, I would say even greater health devolution. Um, you know, those are the critical things, I think. What do I want that uh, Liverpool has got? Well, um, not much. A tunnel would be useful, I guess, under city centre Manchester to put a few trains uh, through it to relieve uh, congestion. Ferries, I'm not sure we've got much, uh, much use for them. Cool. We've got, don't, we, don't go there because uh, you'll, uh, we're going to have, a, we're gonna have a, um, a Liverpool v Manchester battle of music soon. I won't say any more than that, but uh, 
it's coming soon. So you, you we'll we'll decide that one on that night, Stephen, and then we'll see who's laughing. Uh, but yeah, I think I want us all to get a devolution deal because the more you build it out, don't think of devolution as separate places doing separate things. If we move all places forward, the more we can do the critical mass of what we can do together increases. So Steve's got his plan for tidal power on the Mersey. Well, if we had the borrowing power, why couldn't we come in as a partner, a partner on that? Do you see what I mean? So you, you, you start to kind of create an independence of the regions from the Treasury, which I think is where a fiscal independence. So that's that's where devolution, I think, really takes uh, really takes off. Hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Thank you, Andy. And and I suppose just just following on to that and um, maybe looking sort of outside of our, our city centre specifically, EY's recent regional economic forecast highlighted that both Manchester and Liverpool were, were really strong in terms of cities in the UK and their forecast growth. Obviously, that was pre-COVID, but, but really, you know, good sort of employment growth and GVA expected there, which, which shows the strength of those cities. But what that did also highlight was that our larger towns outside of the cities and in the region weren't benefiting from the same growth and investment that Manchester and Liverpool were enjoying. So how can we use devolution and um, other influence to, to spread that um, benefit to the, to the other towns uh, in the region? So, yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've never um, bought into this sort of Patrick Minford type and um, trickle down economics. I, I do think you need interventions and you're right, it's worked in in Liverpool, it's worked in, in Greater Manchester. And, and by the way, just to mention that the power of those two brands, um, myself and Andy, have been to a Bloomberg event in New York. We did something in Paris. And believe me, it's a far easier sell. And I have to say it, Liverpool much more than Manchester on a, a global scale. But the brands are much easier than the West of England or the West Midlands, you know, we've got really, really um, something tangible that people understand and recognise, and we need to do more on that. And then when we do get that inward investments and um, that foreign direct investments as well, what we need to do is to ensure that not just city centres, but the whole combined area uh, ours is six, as you know, and 10 in Manchester, that everybody benefits. And, and the way in which I believe we can do that is I've, I've done a bit of it and I want to do more, but it's like double devolution. We got some money and we then gave it to local authorities themselves to decide how best they could spend that money in town centres, for instance. So we had a, a six million pound town centre fund and we said to them, you come up with innovative plans. Now, we have to assure that that money is spent on what it's being given for. So they can't use it for potholes and, uh, and they can't use it for um, adult social care. And I know there must be a temptation, but they have to use it for what it's allocated for. But it then starts to give local authorities the ability to address some of the problems that you've got and hopefully then that starts to expand across each of those areas and then they hand out some powers not just to the important bit in each of those boroughs but the outline districts or the outline parts of their boroughs and then that's how you truly get this thing to to get to those bits that it currently doesn't even touch Thanks, Jeff. Can I, I just think this is a really important question, this, because obviously the divide between cities and towns was growing anyway. But I'm worried, actually, about what might happen in the moment that we're now in. Um, you could see it both ways. I mean, you could see the city centre economy being hit now because of the, the fewer numbers coming in to work, you know. So can we sustain all the bars, the restaurants? So what will this period that we're in do to the city centre economy? But also, again, what will it do to those towns, those outlying uh, towns? You know, maybe more people home working, more people shopping, eating locally, maybe. My guess is it's going to be tough for both, is what I would imagine. Retail is going to really struggle here, isn't it? Um, 
And I think the high street uh, in the towns is going to be, um, you know, even further damaged. So I think both are going to be damaged, if we're honest. So I think we've got to accelerate our, our, our kind of thinking about rebuilding towns. And I've been long advocating that the, the retail um, uh, offer is not the, is not the future. I don't think you've got to consolidate that to a kind of good quality core. I think we've got to accelerate now, Steve and I, the kind of notion of rethinking towns as places where we put housing and we link housing to leisure and culture, uh, link it to public transport, so we're not building for the car all of the time. I, I think the time has come to accelerate thinking about. Um, rebuilding outlying towns. We've got a mayoral development corporation in Stockport. It was amazing what levels of interest that was getting even before this period. I, I think we need to kind of come back hard at that that whole agenda. Um, if we're going to get funding to build infrastructure, new housing, I would like to see much of that go into the centre of our towns and rebuild, you know, build, rebuild them with modern uh, residential, as modern residential centres linked to public transport, good cycling and walking provision, fantastic digital infrastructure. For me, that's the future of our of our towns. Uh, and if people are home working more, hopefully they'll be more vibrant than they are than they are at the moment. But it's, it's a really serious question that needs a lot of thought, I think. Thanks, Andy. And um, so before my last question, which is, is going to be around COVID and, and business again, just maybe um, a question in terms of your two respective cities. And when you need to look at each other's cities, what do you see as the other city's biggest advantage? Maybe, uh, Andy, I'll pass to you first on that. Um, I mean, when I look at, you know, I obviously, I, you know, feel uh, very privileged to do the role that I do when I look at Manchester, its skyline. I mean, I think it has emerged in so over the last 20, obviously, but even in very recent times, I think it's emerging as a as a global city. Um, it, it looks like that in terms of its uh, physical presence on the landscape. I, I think we would both probably say the transport doesn't match that on the ground um, and we need to see a, a world class transport system to match the uh, you know, increasingly self-confident uh, city. Um, so, and I think, you know, Manchester has made great strides really uh, over the last uh, couple of decades and we were really in a good moment and the frustration is that this has hit us at a, a really challenging time. But, um, you know, I'm really happy with where, where we were getting to um, because it wasn't just about buildings and uh, infrastructure. We had a plan for people as well, you know, kind of the homelessness work we've been doing, uh, giving free travel to our young people. I think young people is a big issue coming out of this, by the way. Steve mentioned skills. You know, we've really all of us got to think about what this has done to some of the life chances of our young people and get their kind of aspirations up again, coming straight out of out of this. So I'm, you know, I'm really proud with where Manchester was. What do I want that Liverpool's got? Um, well, the coastline is helpful, isn't it? You know, that that, that brings certain uh, certain benefits. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a certain uh, certain uh, band that they've got that, that probably doesn't uh, doesn't half help a, li a little bit. But as I say, musically, I think we're a much better placed um, than uh, they rely on one band. We've got oh, you could just reel off tens, twenties. There's so many. Um, but I think the final point I'll come back to is this point about um, about football. You know, I'm I'm hoping that you know three quarters of us today can agree on one thing. So that's half of professional Liverpool all of pro Manchester, that we need to launch a campaign for the cancellation of the Premier League that season. And I'm just hoping that three quarters of the people on this call are right behind me. Thank you, Andy. And Steve, we have to let you come back there in terms of both football and um, Liverpool as well. Well, obviously, being from somewhere that I believe is superior anyway, I'm not going to rise to debate um, I'll, I'll instead um, act more statesmanlike. Now, do you know what? The, the, the great thing about um, what we both do is that we do recognise the strengths in each other's areas. I, I'm from a, a, an age group that I, when I was growing up, I didn't think there was anything at all that I had in common with anyone from Greater Manchester, certainly from Manchester, you know, Man, Man United, Man City. And as you get older and you mature, you start to understand that 
actually there's so much that we have in common. Um, you know, we both have uh, recognisable accents. We both have um, huge cultural assets, musical but other um, assets. We both are very um, robust in our defence of the areas that we're from. We always show solidarity, obviously, from my perspective, um, for a long, long time, for decades, I think that was displayed. But also with the Manchester bomb, you see in the way the, the great people in Manchester all came together. And I'm not sure it would have happened in many other places. So when you put aside some of that nonsense and the tribal rivalries and all that, which I quite like, and we like the banter, we like the, um, the taking the Michael out of each other. When, when you do that, there's a lot more that unites us than divides us. And, and that's what we should concentrate on and going forward. I'd prefer to look at the complementarity of things like us having an international um, waterfront and a deep sea, a deep water port and Manchester having an international airport and thinking about what that means to the northwest because we've both got bits that each other ha hasn't got. And as I say, you know, we do have culture and Manchester will one day catch up. <laughs> Absolutely. Can I, can I just add, add to that, uh, Jen, just, just very, uh, very quickly. Um, have you got me? Uh, am I on? Um, just to say very quickly, I really notice when Steve and I do things jointly, particularly in the media, how much response it gets. I, I think, you know, Steve would say the same. And I think if you look back over our history, we have never really kind of fought together as one Northwest. But when you do, the power, as Steve was just saying, and the complementarity of the two places doesn't half really come together. And if we're honest, loads of people growing up in the Northwest have a bit of both in them. So they kind of, you know, that's the DNA, isn't it? So I think when these two cities do actually sort of stand side by side and make a joint case, it's pretty unanswerable, really. And it's hard for anyone to turn it to turn it down. And that's what we've got to keep keep building, to be honest. And it's why Build Back Better is very much a joint campaign. Thanks, Andy. And, and obviously that connectivity uh, incredibly important if those two cities are to really maximise on on each other's benefits that they, they have. So just one final question before I wrap up, and, and that's really coming back to the current COVID situation. But if you have one ask of business, what would that be? And Andy, I'll pass to you first and, and then we'll go to you, Steve. Thanks, Jen. And thanks to you um, and everyone uh, at Pro Manchester Professional Liverpool for, for doing this. I'm going to have to finish as soon as I've got the BBC trying to get through on the other line. I've got to do an interview for them. Um, I think business has already been brilliant, you know, the way in which businesses across both city regions have stepped forward. Um, so I suppose my ask is let's keep working in that way. Um, you know, let's keep building the, the greater good. Um, the thing that characterises the northwest of England for me is that people want to get on in life. You know, we are entrepreneurial, all of us aspirational. I think we've, we've got a bit of that in both cities. You know, there's a sort of want to sort of like, you know, get out there and shake up the world but we're not the kind of places that just walk on by on the other side. And I think that is actually what sets us apart. That is for me, the character of the Northwest of England. And it's a really fantastic combination. So I would say to business, please keep working with us in that in that way. And, and I know that they I know that they will, you know, you're not straight businesses where you just say, well, we're all just about our own thing and our profits. You know, that's the great thing about businesses across both of these great cities. Um, it is about, making changes that will be good for business but good for everybody uh, coming through this and um, you know we'll look after you as best we can I think Steve and I will both say that but but we do want you to kind of meet us as well you know good employment is not like a, a sort of thing that you know is a, is a left-wing idea it should be a, everyone but you get a better society if everyone in society has some security in their employment and enough money to live on you know that's a better society for everybody is what I would say so kind of come with us on this agenda. You know, we, we'll do what we can to help you. Um, but, you know, let's all help each other uh, coming through this. And, um, you know, I've absolutely every confidence that that's what Northwest businesses will do. So thanks, everybody. And uh, I'll leave you to uh, the great mayor of the Liverpool City region to wrap up and have a go. At me. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Andy.
Thanks, Andy. <laughs> thanks, Andy. Thanks, you yeah. okay. thanks, everyone. I haven't seen you on the telly for hours. Um, the, the, the thing that I'd say that we, what we should do now is, in, with regard to businesses, is for businesses to understand that we're here to help them and to help them, they need to help us. So, you know, speaking through one platform like, like yourselves is a lot better than us trying to respond to hundreds and hundreds of individual inquiries. So I think that's important. And also, and, and I know businesses do this, but it is sort of building on what Andy said. It is that symbiosis of understanding that um, they are part of the wider community. And sometimes they also should be vocal when there are cuts to councils, for instance. And, and where councils uh, do get cuts, well, that means that businesses bleed as well because the knock-on effect and ramifications of that are sometimes we can't do the things that we'd like to do and we can't support businesses in the ways that we'd like to help them. So um, I think that's, that's the way. If we all work together, perhaps we will get that build back better and we'll get a better understanding of our individual parts in a better society and a better economy. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for your time. So we all know that it's currently vitally important that we stay in to save lives and protect the NHS. Equally, it's also a time for us as business leaders to take the right decisions now and plan for emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic, whenever that might be. And we can't just return to our old ways. We won't be able to. And I think Andy and Steve have alluded to some of the key things that we're going to have to work with, both the public transport constraints and staggered working times potentially. So some real things for, for you to be thinking about within your businesses. We all have a great opportunity to work together, change our approach, both to how we work, but also to address some of those wide, wider issues in society that Andy and Steve alluded to, be that carbon reduction, tackling inequality or homelessness. All these areas need to be considered as we move into the new normal. And we need to take this current crisis and use it as an opportunity and work together to build back better than we were before. Working together and, and building on each city's regional strengths has to be the best way forward. To affect that real change, it will take all of us speaking with one voice to local and central government. So a huge thank you to our Metro Mayors, Steve Rotherham and Andy Burnham. And also a thank you to Chris Peacock and Grayling for their support in preparing for this event. I hope you found it really useful, uh, insightful and informative and good luck to all of you and your businesses as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you.